Good morning. Turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 9. We're going to begin in verse 7 this morning. Luke chapter 9, verse 7. Now Herod the Tetrarch heard about all that was happening, and he was perplexed, because it was said by some that John had been raised from the dead, and by some that Elijah had appeared, and by others that one of the prophets of old had risen. Herod said, John I beheaded, but who is this about whom I hear such things? And he sought to see him. On their return, the apostles told him all that they had done. And he took them and withdrew apart to a town called Bethsaida. When the crowds learned it, they followed him, and he welcomed them and spoke to them of the kingdom of God and cured those who had need of healing. Now the day began to wear away, and the twelve came and said to him, See the crowd, sorry, send the crowd away into the surrounding villages and countryside to find lodging and get provisions. For we are here in a desolate place. But he said to them, You give them something to eat. They said, We have no more than five loaves and two fish, unless we're to go and buy food for all these people. For there were about five thousand men. And he said to his disciples, Have them sit down in groups of about fifty each. And they did so, and had them all sit down. And taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing over them. And he broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples to set before the crowd. And they all ate and were satisfied. What was left over was picked up, twelve baskets full of broken pieces. Now it happened that as he was praying alone, the disciples were with him. And he asked them, Who do the disciples say that I am? And they answered, John the Baptist. But others say, Elijah. And others, that one of the prophets of old has risen. Then he said to them, But who do you say that I am? And Peter answered, The Christ of God. Let's pray together. Righteous Heavenly Father, thank you for blessing us with this day and our time together to worship you and to study from your word. Righteous Father, I pray that you help us to understand this confession uh, that Peter gave, that your son, uh, that your son Jesus of Nazareth is the Christ of God. Help us, Father, to understand what that means. Help us, Father, to appreciate it. Uh, For, Father, it is something that uh, many of us brought up in the faith uh, even take for granted. And, Father, help us to understand its implications for our lives. Righteous Father, we thank You for blessing us in Your Son. It's in His name that we offer our thanks. Amen. So we've read a couple of passages this morning. Um, with this question on people's lips. In fact, it's a question that appears earlier in the Gospel of Luke, at the end of Luke chapter 7. You remember, as Jesus uh, is sitting in Simon the Pharisee's house, uh, this sinful woman comes in and begins crying on his feet and washing his feet off with her hair and putting uh, ointment on his feet. And Simon the Pharisee is wondering in his mind, well... Surely, if this guy was a prophet, he would know that this is a sinful woman who's doing this to him. In other words, that he's being corrupted by her touch. And Jesus, of course, knows what he's thinking. And he calls him out on it and tells a parable uh, with the result that he who is forgiven little loves little, uh, but he who is forgiven much loves much. And he said to her, we read at the end of chapter 7, Your sins are forgiven. Then those who were at table with him began to say among themselves, Who is this who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. But that question, who is this? They're in wonder at what Jesus has done. They're taken aback at what Jesus has done, and they can't quite figure Jesus out. They can't place Jesus. It's not just uh, confined to the Pharisees, this reaction. This is something we also find among the disciples in Luke chapter 8. 
that one day he got into a boat with his disciples and he said to them, let us go across to the other side of the lake. So they set out and as they sailed, he fell asleep. And a windstorm came down on the lake and they were filling with water and were in danger. And they went and woke him saying, Master, Master, we're perishing. And he awoke and rebuked the wind and the raging waves and they ceased and there was a calm. He said to them, where is your faith? And they were afraid, and they marveled, saying to one another, Who then is this that he commands even winds and water, and they obey him, or listen to him, as we pointed out last Sunday? So even the disciples are still trying to wrap their minds around this question, Who is this man that we have been following? That he's able even to command the winds and the waves, and they obey him. And so it's no surprise that we find this very question on Herod the Tetrarch's lips uh, when he has heard about everything that's been happening. We'll establish some context for that in just a second. Um, But he hears it said that John has been raised from the dead. Others are saying that Elijah has appeared. Others still say that one of the prophets of old has risen. And Herod asks... Well, I beheaded John, but who is this about whom I hear such things? And this question about Jesus' identity finally comes to a head later in the chapter, at the end of the reading that we just took. Now, it happened that as he was praying alone, the disciples were with him, and he asked them. Jesus brings this question to its culmination. He brings it to a head. Who do the crowds say that I am? And notice here, he doesn't just say, Who am I? But he's leading them along a bit. He says, Who do the crowds say that I am? And their answer should be familiar to us. Because their answer is just the same thing that Herod heard. In fact, Herod and the disciples have heard the same thing. Some are saying... John the Baptist. Others say Elijah. And others still that one of the prophets of old has arisen. And then Jesus brings it to this fine point, but who do you say that I am? And it's at that point that Peter makes what we call the great confession. That he says, the Christ of God. That Peter, for some reason, understands something about Jesus that nobody else up to this point has really grasped in calling Jesus the Christ of God. Now let's explain for just a minute what Peter means here. All right, because Christ, the word translated Christ in our English Bibles, is Christos. It just means Messiah or anointed one. In fact, the word Christos is used of many people in Scripture other than Jesus of Nazareth. It does not mean that they are the Christ of God. It means that they are anointed by God. In fact, if you look at the the bulletin article today on Psalm 2, uh, you'll see that Psalm 2 names King David as God's anointed. Uh, that God anoints kings. Um, In other places, in Isaiah, the prophet identifies King Cyrus, a pagan king, as God's anointed. In other words, the one that God chose to do His work. But Peter here doesn't just say God's anointed or an anointed one. um, Because in Scripture, everyone who is anointed is anointed by God. Uh, It has that sense to it that God is behind the anointing. But here he specifies and he amplifies, you are the Christ of God. In other words, he recognizes that Jesus' appointment by God is something special, something that goes beyond just John the Baptist or Elijah or one of the other prophets, all of whom were also anointed by God. But Peter recognizes that there is something different about Jesus. Now, why is it that he recognizes this? All right, there are a lot of answers that are given for this. Um, we might consider that right in between these two questions, Herod the Tetrarch questioning who Jesus is, and Jesus himself asking this question of his apostles, Who am I? We have this episode of the feeding of the 5,000. And so some have speculated 
that Peter has finally come to this realization now that he has seen the feeding of the 5,000. Perhaps, although we should also consider what happens immediately before Herod asks this question. Uh, Go back to verse 1 of chapter 9. He called the twelve together and gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases, and he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal. So in other words, they've got two jobs. Go out and proclaim the kingdom and heal people. And they are given miraculous power. They are given the authority to cast out demons and to cure diseases. And he said to them, Take nothing for your journey, no staff, no bag, nor bread, nor money, and do not have two tunics. And whatever house you enter, stay there, and from there depart. And wherever they do not receive you, when you have... When you leave that town, shake off the dust from your feet as a testimony against them. And they departed and went through the villages preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. All right, so they go out and they perform their commission. They're using this miraculous power and they're going out and healing people and they are preaching the kingdom. They're preaching the gospel, Luke tells us here at the end. Now Herod the Tetrarch heard about all that was happening. In other words, that's the context here. That Herod has heard all of this stuff that the disciples are doing. That they are going around, they're preaching the kingdom, they're casting out demons, and they're healing the sick. And that leads Tetrarch, uh, Herod the Tetrarch to question, who is this that I'm hearing so much about? And Herod, having seen these wonders, or at least having heard about these wonders, having heard about the preaching of the kingdom cannot come to a conclusion. He said, well, it can't be John. I cut his head off. So who is it that I'm hearing about? So has Peter reacted to basically the same information? Um, Perhaps, perhaps not. Notice the way that Luke frames the feeding of the 5,000. It's very similar to the sending out of the 12. And in fact... The twelve returning is what kicks off the he- uh, sorry the feeding of the five thousand. Um, upon their return, the apostles told him all that they had done, and he took them and withdrew apart to a town called Bethsaida. When the crowds learned it, they followed him, and he welcomed them. And notice what Jesus is doing here. Jesus is doing two things. He spoke to them of the kingdom of God and cured those who had need of healing. In other words, he's doing exactly the same thing that the disciples were doing in their commission at the beginning of the chapter. They've gone out to preach the kingdom and to heal. And here, Jesus is doing that. And we notice, again, in both instances, that there's a lack of provision. Jesus commands the disciples, don't take your staff with you, don't take your bag, don't take bread, don't take money, don't take anything. Don't even take a change of clothing with you. Go out and preach and you'll be provided for, is the idea. And here we find exactly the same thing. Now the day began to wear away, and the twelve came and said to him, Send the crowd away to go into the surrounding villages and countryside to find lodging and get provisions. For we are here in a desolate place. And they're all there and they have nothing. And the message here, as it was there, is that God will provide. Jesus says, you give them something to eat. And they say, we have no more than five loaves and two fish unless we are to go and buy food for all these people. So Jesus has these 5,000 plus women and children sit down in groups of 50 and He miraculously takes the loaves and the fish and He provides for all of them. So we've got two very similar episodes and two very different reactions. So is it, strictly speaking, that Peter has just been able to see Jesus' wondrous work and now it clicks? The text never tells us that. In fact, Luke does not explain to us how it is that Peter comes to understand that Jesus is the Christ of God. And besides, Peter has already seen so much What would it be about the feeding of the 5,000 that just suddenly makes it click? We suspect that there's something more behind this. Something that Peter has access to that Herod the Tetrarch does not have access to. 
Let's do a little more reading. Maybe we can arrive at an answer to this question. But I also want us to get at, well, what does this confession mean that Jesus is the Christ of God? What does it mean and what are its implications for us? Let's pick up our reading right after Peter has made his confession. He strictly charged and commanded them to tell this to no one, saying, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. In short, that is what it means for Him to be the Christ of God. Notice that it's right after that Peter makes this confession that Jesus reveals this to them. And by the, this is the first time that Jesus has revealed this in Luke's Gospel. That He must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. This is not the last time that He says it. But let's continue on. He said to all, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words, of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in his glory, in the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. But I tell you truly, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. Now about eight days after these sayings, he took with him Peter and John and James and went up on the mountain to pray. And as he was praying, the appearance of his face was altered, and his clothing became dazzling white. And behold, two men were talking with him, Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and those who were with him were heavy with sleep, but when they became fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. And as the men were parting from him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good that we're here. Let us make three tents, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. As he was saying these things, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were afraid as they entered the cloud. And a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my Son, my Chosen One. Listen to Him. When the, cloud had, sorry, when the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. And they kept silent and told no one in those days anything of what they had seen. On the next day, when they had come down from the mountain, a great crowd met him. And behold, a man from the crowd cried out, Teacher, I beg you to look at my son, for he is my only child. And behold, a spirit seizes him, and he suddenly cries out. It convulses him so that he foams at the mouth and shatters him, and will hardly leave him. And I begged your disciples to cast it out, but they could not. And Jesus answered, O faithless and twisted generation, how long am I to be with you and bear with you? Bring your son here. And while he was coming, the demon threw him to the ground and convulsed him. But Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit and healed the boy and gave him back to his father. And all were astonished at the majesty of God. But while they were all marveling at everything he was doing, Jesus said to his disciples, let these words sink into your ears. The Son of Man is about to be delivered into the hands of men. But they did not understand this saying, and it was concealed from them so that they might not perceive it. And they were afraid to ask Him about this saying. An argument arose among them as to which of them was the greatest. But Jesus, knowing the reasoning of their hearts, took a child and put him by his side and said to them, Whoever receives this child in my name receives me. And whoever receives me receives him who sent me. For he who is least among you is the one who is great. Now, this seems like a, a string of unconnected stories. Now, what is Luke doing here? Showing us uh, Jesus warning them that He's going to be killed and raised. And then giving this teaching about uh, taking up your cross daily and following Jesus. And then the transfiguration on the mountain. And then casting out the demon uh, from the man's son. 
And then another warning that Jesus is going to be delivered into the hands of men. And then this argument about who is the greatest. It seems like just a random string of stories. But if we've learned anything from studying Luke, it's that Luke never, ever just randomly strings things along. He's building his point here. Notice that we receive not one, but two warnings about Jesus' death. So who is this that they are dealing with? Peter says he is the Christ of God. And it's at that point that Jesus begins to explain, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. Let these words sink into your ears. The Son of Man is about to be delivered into the hands of men. So Peter has gotten something, and Jesus recognizes that they are ready to learn something more about him, that they're ready to go to the next level, as it were, that they're ready to start learning this new lesson. But even this new lesson comes with difficulty. They did not understand this saying, and it was concealed from them so that they might not perceive it, and they were afraid to ask him about this saying. But that is part of what characterizes the Christ of God, the one who is sent by God. That He is to suffer, be rejected, killed, and raised. Now it's pretty clear that the apostles still don't quite get what is going on. Uh, That is given to us in the transfiguration. As they go up on the mountain, they see Jesus along with Moses and Elijah... And what Luke does here is he's connecting this to the questions that's already been asked. Who is this? Remember, who do the crowds say that Jesus is? Herod and the apostles both hear the same thing. Some say that it's John, some say that it's Elijah, but others that one of the prophets of old has uh, has risen. And who do we see on the mountain but Jesus, Moses, and Elijah? What is Moses doing there? You might remember that God makes a promise to Israel through Moses. And in fact, here on the mount, that promise is alluded to. Remember, the cloud of uh, glory comes over them, and the voice comes out of the cloud saying, This is my Son, my Chosen One. Listen to Him. And that takes us back to what happened in Deuteronomy chapter 18. Deuteronomy 18.15, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me, Moses says, from among you, from your brothers. It is to him you shall listen just as you desired of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly, when you said, let, uh, let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God or see this great fire any more, lest I die. But we don't often think of Moses in this way. We often think of Moses just as lawgiver. Right? But he is identified here as a prophet of God. He says, The Lord will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your brethren. It is to him you shall listen. And so it's no surprise that here on the mount, when Jesus is transfigured, we find Moses, one of the prophets of old. And the voice coming out of the cloud, and again, remember, how has God been with Israel in the wilderness? but in cloud and in fire. And the voice comes out of the cloud and tells Peter and John and James, This is my Son, my Chosen One. Listen to Him. And so we have the same question asked again. 
Alright, so because we're seeing Elijah, we're seeing one of the prophets of old risen, and we see Jesus. And Peter has recognized that Jesus is different from Elijah or one of the prophets of old or John the Baptist. He recognizes that he's not that, that he is the Christ of God. But Peter still hasn't quite figured out what that signifies, how important that is. Because Peter says to Jesus, Master, it's good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah as if they're on an equal playing field. And that is when the voice comes and corrects Peter. He says, no, you've got this wrong. This is my son. Listen to him. And then what do we see whenever the cloud is taken away? But Jesus alone. Moses and Elijah are no longer there. And so one of the things that we learn from Jesus' identity of the Christ of God is that he is not in the same league as Moses and Elijah and John the Baptist. Not even the same ballpark. I mean, we are, we're talking completely different levels here. That our reaction to Jesus should be something special and unique. But what does that reaction look like? Jesus teaches us this, and He teaches it again twice. Right after Jesus has made His first warning that the Son of Man must suffer, He says, If anyone would come after Me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow Me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for My sake will save it. In other words, just as the Son of Man has to suffer, it is your lot as a disciple of the Son of Man to suffer. If you're going to follow Me, take up your cross daily. Bear the same burden that your Master bore. And again, after Jesus delivers His second warning, He says, let these words sink into your ears. The Son of Man is about to be delivered into the hands of men. Immediately after that, after the text tells us they have no idea what he's talking about, Luke tells us an argument arose among them as to which of them was the greatest. But Jesus, knowing the reasoning of their hearts, took a child and put him by his side and said to them, Whoever receives this child in my name receives me. And whoever receives me receives him who sent me. For he who is least among you all is the one who is great." So what demand does this confession make on us? He makes it pretty explicit in his first warning. Take up your cross daily, follow me. In the second warning, in the second instruction, he says, whoever receives this child in my name receives me. What is the point of this comparison to a child? This happens a few times in the Gospels. I think sometimes we get the wrong idea about the comparison. That he sets up the child as some ideal of innocence. Friends, if you've raised children, you know that that's just dead wrong. That's something that only exists in storybooks. Innocent child is an oxymoron. And it's unbiblical. You never find the innocent child in Scripture. What he's pointing out instead, and let's, let's just catch the nature of his logic here, for he, so in other words, because, all right, because he who is least among you is the one who is great. I'm showing you this child to show you that the least among you all is the one who is great. He pulls out a child, not because a child has some sort of mythical, rosy-cheeked, innocence to him, but because a child is low status and powerless in the ancient world. And we talk about this pretty often in Luke. But you're right, who's at the bottom of the social totem pole in the ancient Near East? It's usually you know, foreigners, women, especially single women, widows especially, and orphans. Right, because in the ancient Near East, socially they had absolutely no power and no status. 
That might be something a little foreign for us to recognize uh, because in our culture, perhaps we give children too much power and too much status. But in the ancient Near East, the child, the child is literally property in the ancient Near East. That's how they would have seen a child. Who is this child? He's nothing. He is nobody. Jesus says, you want to be great in this kingdom? Be like this child. Whoever is going to be greatest among you is the one who becomes least. And hopefully we can see the echo here of what he has already said. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself. Take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? In other words, you know, we think about status in these terms. Having power, having some share of things in the world. Jesus says, deny that. Get rid of that. The one who, who denies himself, the one who's not asserting himself, the one who takes up his cross, the one who's willing to lose his life for the sake of Jesus, will save it. That is the demand that Peter's confession makes on us. That Jesus is the Christ of God. It means that we become like the Christ of God. And that He suffers, that He gives Himself, that He makes Himself least of all. Because we know that He becomes greatest of all. Uh, Paul summarizes all of this, wraps this all up in Philippians chapter 2. I often turn to this passage just because it's a really good one. In Philippians chapter 2, he says, "...have this mind among yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who though He was in the form of God..." Sorry, being in the form of God did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied Himself by taking on the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, He humbled Himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, and notice the way that this works, Jesus empties Himself, He humbles Himself, He pours Himself out, He becomes the least of all. He becomes nothing. Because who is a dead man hanging on a cross? Compared to that, even some orphan child has more power and more status. He is least of all. Therefore, Paul says, because of this, God has highly exalted Him and bestowed on Him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The one who becomes least of you all will become greatest. And Jesus shows us that Himself by becoming least of all and being highly exalted above every name. And notice here, Paul even ties in the confession. The confession is tied in here. Every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Go ahead and take out your songbooks. There was one question that we didn't quite reach a conclusion to. How is it that Peter knew? What was the difference between him and Herod the Tetrarch that let him say that Jesus is the Christ of God? We get a hint of this in what Jesus says to them. He says, let these words sink into your ears. He's urging them, hear what I have to say. 
As we just saw last Sunday, reading through Luke chapter 8, hearing is essential. Not just letting the sounds come in, but understanding what you're hearing, understanding the importance of it, and acting on it. He says, let these words sink into your ear. And Luke doesn't tell us explicitly what it was that gave Peter this insight. But in the context, we suspect that it's Peter has been hearing Jesus. Herod has not. It's not just that Peter has had an audience with Jesus and Herod has not. Even if Herod was there, he probably still wouldn't understand because Peter has been hearing. And as we hear the Word of God, we are called to act. To make the same confession that Jesus made, that Jesus is the Christ of God, that Jesus is Lord of all, appointed by God the Father. And to act on that confession by taking up our cross daily, by becoming least of all, not asserting our own desires and will, but submitting to the will of our Father. That is the call today. Have you made that confession of faith that Peter made? Having heard the Word of God, will you make that confession? If you have made that confession, have you lived up to it? Have you taken up your cross? Have you made yourself least of all? It may be that you need to make that confession, that you need to be baptized into Christ for the first time, or it may be that you've abandoned that confession, you've abandoned your baptism, and you need to be restored. Whatever the case may be, we stand ready to help. If you will come forward as together we stand and sing.
good to be here this morning. I want to thank Caleb for that uh, excellent lesson. And we thank you for being here this morning and encouraging um, all the rest of us. And we hope that you can be back tonight at 6 o'clock for our uh, worship service and, and a Q&A from Caleb um, this evening. We'll be back also at Thursday, on Thursday at 7, for Bible study. Are there any announcements that need to be made before we are dismissed? Hey, George Floyd is going to uh, lead our closing prayer. Very good, George. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day that you've given us this opportunity to be here. We may have to get here another portion of the day. Father, we thank you for this. Bless you, Brother Caleb, for all that you do. We ask that you might continue to be with him. For he's a great ruler. You might always speak your word as it is written, but adding to your age and to your will. Father, we ask that you might be with those of the number here that 